Father, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to worship you. Thank you that we have the privilege of doing that. Thank you, Father, that we can do that with a free heart. And we can do it in this nation freely in Jesus' name. And Lord, that we will declare the things of God in this nation from the furthest regions, north and south and east and west. Your name is being lifted up. And your name is a high tower. And your name is powerful and mighty. And your name is above every name. And every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord, is the King, is the Master, is the great I Am. And that is who we worship. And that is who we bow down. That He is Lord. He is our God. So Father, we give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Whew. Thank you, worship team. Wow. Well, when you come hungry, you get fed. When you come thirsty, you drink deep. When you come tired, you get renewed. When you come fearful, he breaks the chains. When you come worried, he gives you hope. Come worried and weak, he gives you strength and peace. Isn't that our God? Yeah, amen. amen. Well, thank you for praying for April and I and our family. We were away for a week. We left Thursday, uh, last Thursday, and we uh, flew out to uh, Calgary and uh, rented a car the next day and headed up to the mountains. You've been into the mountains? Beautiful out there. We went up to Banff and a few places we haven't seen for quite some time. The interesting thing is about flying, though, is all the preparation. I, fi I find sometimes preparing to go away is more work than staying. And, uh, and, of course, we had to do everything and go online, and you get your boarding passes, and you get the tags for your bags and all that stuff. And, and you hurry, and you load that in the car, and you drive there, and you get park and fly or whatever you want to use. And, and then, uh, you know, they got to get you there, and you get there, and check your bags and they check all your stuff, go down that line, do that, go over there, go there, take your bag. Is it too heavy? No, good, put it on there. You got to check that first, right? And then you go. And then you go down to your gate and you sit and then you wait until they call you and then you get on the airplane and then you wait. There's something about rushing to wait. You ever think about that? Rushing to wait, go, 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 go. And, and the interesting thing is while you're sitting at the airport waiting for you to, them to call your zone, because you know, everybody's in zones, except business class, they have their own title, but zone, and we're sitting there waiting, and I'm watching people. And a lot of people these days have electronics, of course, so a lot of people are on their electronics, but some are just sitting there like this, looking around. Some are like this. You know, everybody's doing something different, and it's just interesting to watch as we all bide our time. Now, the interesting thing is when we got on the airplane, it took forever to taxi out of Toronto. I think we toured half the city on an airplane. Like, it was ridiculous. We were just slowly going here, and then we were going there, and we're bouncing along going here and there because they're tearing up a lot of the runways, and they're redoing them, unbeknownst to us, until we came back. And so we're, we're going, and then when we do get up in the sky, I don't know how high we were, but we hit this uh, uh, turbulence, and this plane was dropping six, seven feet, like up and then down and then up and then down for like 20 minutes. And the captain comes on, and he goes, I'm trying to find a better altitude. You know, that's about what it was like. So he was trying to get permission to go higher, lower, whatever. So eventually we got, so I started praying. I said, Lord, put us in the smooth zone, wherever that is, because I'm tired of almost up chucking my, my breakfast here. Let's just, you know, get in some place where it's smooth. And thankfully we did. We got into Calgary an hour and a half or so late after all that. And then on the exciting way home, we did the same thing, rush there, get the bags, do all that, ba 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 boom and then you sit there and wait. And then we got on the airplane. And we're sitting in the airplane, and nothing's happening. And the captain comes on, he says, we just found out that the computers for all planes to leave have, are crashed. The computers aren't working. So we will let you know when we can leave. And we're all sitting on the airplane. And I'm thinking, why didn't they tell us that so we could have just sat in the airport instead of sitting on the airplane? And nobody can move. You know, don't use the washrooms, don't do this, don't do that. So we're sitting there. We sat there for 35 minutes, almost 40 minutes. 
And they kept coming on once in a while, we're hoping soon to have the things up and da-da-da. And we just want to let you know, by the way, that uh, the Toronto airport is being tore up, so not all the runways are available. So we will have to wait till we get permission to first leave, but also to land. So once you get up in the air and you don't get permission to land, what are you supposed to do? <laughs> Think about that, you know, on one of those airplanes. So, so eventually we got permission to take off, but as we're flying, the pilot comes on and he says, um, it's going to take a while to land, so we're going to have to circle. Now, when you're on the, in those seats, there's a little map you can bring up, right? You can either watch a TV show, a movie, or something. Or you can bring this so I bring this map up. We could have landed in Collingwood. We went right over it. We could have, like, I mean, into Toronto, then fly all the way up over Collingwood, and then down around Barrie. We looped. That's how far a loop we had to take. And then we came all the way down into parts of southeastern Ontario, and we looped again. By the time we landed in Toronto, we were another hour and a half late. So why do we rush to be late? Why do we rush just to wait? You know, everybody handles remaining time different, abiding time different, don't we? Some of us get bored, some of us sleep, some of us get anxious. Uh, you know, everybody acts different when those moments... And so watching that was interesting. I just sort of go, whatever. I'm in God's hands. Whatever goes on, goes on. So get the plane off the ground. But then after that, I'm fine. But, you know, there's two ways you can look at this. Because I started thinking about this. Because the, because the bride of Christ, the bride has to abide. The bride, the bride has to wait. And, you know, in, when an actual wedding, it's usually everybody waiting for the bride. Correct? Isn't that true? You know, I've been to weddings where the bride there is early, and I've, been to, I've done weddings where the bride is like a half hour, 45 minutes late. So the bride is in control, but I want to tell you, though, there's something different in the body of Christ. The bride, who's the bride? The church. We have to abide. The bride has to abide in Christ, in the bridegroom. We have to abide in Him. And so there's a couple of ways that we react to these things. Uh, the first one is uh, we are here on earth for a season of time just marked out for us, just marked out by God. So in other words, the beginning and the end. It tells us this in Psalm 90 verse 10. The length of our days is how many? 70 or 80 if we have the strength. Some of you are older than that. Some of you are a lot younger than that. Yet, listen to this. Their span is but trouble and sorrow. Doesn't that make you want to just jump up and go, whoa. For they quickly pass and we fly away. <laughs> if that, so if you're trying to lead somebody to Christ, don't use that passage. Okay, that's not a good approach for telling them about the Lord. And then how about this one? I love this in the message. Psalm 39, verse 4 and 6 in the message. Tell me, what's going on, God? How long do I have to live? Give me the bad news. <laughs> You kept me on pretty short rashes. My life is string too short to be saved. Oh, we're all puffs of air. <laughs> we're all puffs of air. Oh, we're all shadows in the campfire. I like that one. Oh, we're all spit in the wind. We make our pile, then we leave it. Don't use that one either. <laughs> okay, you know, I mean, just encourages us so much about our lives. And so, but sometimes, you know, some of us are just walking out every day, just saying, that's all there is to life. We just walk it out every day, and this is it. But, you know, there's another side to this besides the sweet by and by, and that is we're on earth, earth for a season of time, not just marked out for us, not just. Tells us in John 17, 4, in New Living Translation, Jesus speaking, he says, I brought glory to you, he's talking to the Father, here on earth by doing everything you told me to do. So Jesus was not putting in the sweet by and by. He was not just a spit or a puff or a shadow. He was actually doing what the Father told him to do. Philippians 3, 13, 14. Paul writes about himself. Brethren, I do not consider that I've made it my own. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The day the church starts to really live this, when we start to really live this, the world changes. But unfortunately, sometimes we're abiding the other way, in the sweet by and by, and not doing what he called us to do. It's a different view. I'm not here to put in time. Thank you very much. 
because I don't know the times I have, but I'm not here just to put in time. And there are days I feel like that's what I'm doing. And I'm going to abide. i got to be about the business of the Father according to His Word, according to His commands, and the calling that He has in your life. Are you doing what God has called you to do? You say, well, I'm a homekeeper, or I'm a mom, or, you know, the list goes on and on of all the things we're doing. But is that really what God has called us to do? Is there something beyond that that He's speaking about here? Because the time is coming when all of us, here's some good news, are going to die, right? But physically, yes, yeah, spiritually, never. We don't, we don't die, we live to live. <laughs> we live here on earth to live in heaven. So there's, there's a transitional point that will come, but it will come for all of us. And I want to be found faithful, and I want to be wise in my investments for the things of the kingdom. I want to produce fruit that will remain. I love, the, you know, when you go to, I'm thinking of a Hawaii, I, pineapples. I, you know, Josh, I get, do you ever just get fresh pineapples? Like all the time, right? Like here we get fresh apples, let's say. There they can get fresh pineapple. And when I was in Ghana doing mission and we were driving along the side of the road, the lady stopped who was with us, who was overseeing the trip, and she said, hey, we're going to get some fresh pineapple. And I love pineapple. So we go over there and the ladies are there with their machetes. They were friendly. And, uh, you know, they take, out, they take out the pineapple. Whack! You know, chop the top bottom, chop the bottom. And then they take the sides off and then they go. There you go. And it just so... Anybody else like pineapple? Are you getting hungry for that? Josh, you should have brought some. And, and you know, we're just, it just melted in your mouth. Now, that's fruit you want, right? That's the stuff you like. You ever had a bad apple? Or you peeled an orange? One day I was driving, and it was, it was night, and I peeled an orange, and I couldn't see it. And I took a bite out of it, and I almost spit it all over the windshield. And then I pulled over and turned the light on. The thing was all brown inside. And I'd taken a bite of that. That's some fruit you don't want. Because there's fruit that is produced in your body afterwards you don't want either, if you know what I mean. So, so yeah, so, so what kind of fruit will I produce? Am I going to abide for, for good fruit, bad fruit? What is my life going to look like? If I'm going to abide with him, as it tells us, as you turn with me to John 15, we have it on the screen as well. But if you have it, follow along in John 15, verses 1 to 7, because this is what Jesus wants us to learn about abiding, about remaining, and what does it look like for followers of Christ. And so Jesus is a long way through his ministry at this point. And it's getting closer and closer to where he's going to be arrested. And so he's trying to teach the disciples and us what the future looks like in the sense of when he's gone. He's saying, this is what you need to do. So this is what he says. He says, I am the true vine and my father is the what? Gardener. So we'll listen to what he does right away. This is how Jesus starts off. He says, he cuts off every branch in me so he's already saying the connection is there, already in me that bears no what? Fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes or cleans so that it will be even more fruitful. How many of you have fruit trees? Chester, you work with fruit trees a lot. Why do you prune them? Exactly. And you've got to know how to prune them. That's the thing. You know, if you just take a chainsaw to an apple tree and cut off the top and make it look like a head, that's not going to work. you got to know how to go in there and do the pruning. Well, I think the Lord knows something about pruning. Because he goes on to say, you have already been clean because of the word I have spoken to you. In other words, he says, I'm washing you with the word. I'm cleansing you and I'm pruning you. And then he says, remain in me and I will, say will, I will remain in you. Is there any question in that one? He says, no branch can bear fruit by itself. Now, you can't take a branch and stick it here in a little piece of dirt, and I stand here and I'll say, okay, you little sprout, produce an apple. Come on. And it goes. I turned pretty red to add that. Um, did it do it by itself? No. No. You say, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. Well, isn't that what it says here? 
No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must what? Remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you what? Hmm. Then he says, I am the vine, Jesus, and you, us, are the branches. If, say if, oh, there's that big word, if a man or a woman remains in me and I am him, he will, listen to this, you will bear much fruit. So he says, I am there and you are with me. I will remain in you. And if you remain in me, you're going to have results. It's not you doing it. It's me. Isn't that awesome? It's what God does. And so when Josh and Melissa were talking about all these Muslims getting saved, it's not Josh and Melissa. It's not YWAM. Who's doing it? God's doing it. It's what He does. It's not what we do, but we have the, the joy of being in the fruit of it all. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away. It withers such branches. They're then picked up, thrown in the fire, and burnt. If you remain in me and my words, now he's saying more than that, so you remain in me and my words in you, listen to this, ask whatever you wish and will be given to you. So don't just walk away going, okay, you know, I just heard from the pastor, I wish, I wish that I could go to Hawaii and live forever. Just besides you, Debbie saying this. Um, but you know what I'm saying? There's a, there's a front end to this. What does it say first? What are you going to have to do? Remain in Him and His words remain in you. In other words, if there's this connection, what you ask for will be from that connection. It won't be outside of it. It'll be inside the framework that He's laying out here. And then he says this, this is to my Father's glory. What's going to happen here? That you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be, at the end of this, my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I've loved you. Now, remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in His love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that my, uh, your joy may be complete. My command is this, Love each other as I have loved you. And then he says these famous words, greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. Who is he talking about? Himself. He says, you are my friends. If you do what I command, you're my friends. If you do what I command, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. This is my command, love each other. There's a lot of stuff here, isn't there? But there's, there's four predominant characteristics I want us to see. If I'm going to be a growing, abiding disciple in Christ, if the church is going to be this bride, there's four things here that are pointed out to us that I want to talk about. I'm, not going, to, I'm going to talk about one today. We'll carry on another day. The first one is a, dis, a disciple stays close to the master. So we have to stay close. The second one is a disciple is fruitful, right? We see that. Thirdly, a disciple obeys the master. Whatever the master asks. And fourthly, a disciple loves others. And our goal here is to make fully devoted disciples who love God, love, and serve the world, right? And so this is what we need to do. A disciple stays close to the master. A disciple is fruitful. A disciple obeys the master. And a disciple loves others. So the first one that we want to sort of dissect is a disciple stays close to the master. Now, 11 times in this passage that we've read, 11 times Jesus says, remain or abide. 11 times. You think that's important? That he would say it that many times over and over and over again because he knows you and I sometimes don't get what he's saying. And he's saying it to us because this is important. So he's saying, you need to remain or abide. Now, the root of that in the Greek is meno, M-E-N-O. It is actually a verb. And as a verb, it's an action word. It's not an idle word. It's not naming it like a noun. It's a verb. It's not an adverb. It's a verb. It's a verb of action. 
So in other words, for me to remain, I have to be actively remaining. I cannot be passive. I cannot be stagnant in my remaining. And that's the point that Jesus is making. It's a permanence of position. It's not a shifting thing. It's actively ongoing. And I have to have personal roots that go deep in my relationship with Jesus. And I need to allow him and ask him to fill every part of my daily life and my activities. And I don't always do that. I don't. And I need to, though. And he's, as I read this, I go, oh, Lord, you're speaking to me here. You're reminding me. And it tells us in Ephesians 3, 17 and 19, the NIV, so that Christ may dwell in your what? Through what? Faith. And I pray, he says, I pray that being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love, to know is to, to experience in the Greek language. Whenever you see know, it is knowledge from experience, not just head knowledge, but beyond head knowledge. To know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be, what? Filled to the measure of the fullness of God. Have you ever filled a glass too full when you're talking to somebody and you spill it? You ever do that? I did that yesterday, actually. We were at a 60th birthday party down in uh, Leamington Way for April's sister, who's turning 60 today, actually. And uh, for Mother's Day for April's mom, and a bunch of us were there. And uh, we had these two pitchers of pop, and uh, I was pouring one, and I wasn't paying attention. And guess what happened? The cup overfloweth, and onto the arm and everywhere. So, you know, and, and pop is sticky, so... But here he's saying about the spirit and the love relationship that we have being grafted in, that we are connected and remain to be filled to the measure of the fullness of God. It's a fullness of God. It, it's amazing to me. It's the measure of what God has for us. It's what he wants to give us. It's overflowing. It's abundant. There's no lack with God in the sense of the things of the Spirit, and I need to be rooted and established in His love. I was reading through uh, Dr. Bruce Wilkinson, and we've always appreciated his stuff, um, when he did these two little booklets, uh, The Prayer of Jabez, and uh, the, the other one is Secrets of the Vine. And so I was reading through The Secrets of the Vine again as I was working on this message, and, and um, I'd highlighted this some time ago, and I, I just want to quote it to you from page 103 where he wrote this, Abiding is all about the most important friendship of your life. Now, my most important friendship, you would think, is April, my wife. And we have a great friendship. But the Lord is number one. The Lord is number one. Are you hearing me, folks? The Lord is number one. And then everything else falls after that. And that's what he says here. Abiding doesn't measure how much you know about your faith. Or your Bible, you can quote all kinds of scriptures. That's good to memorize, but that's not what he's talking about. In abiding, listen to this, you seek, long for, thirst for, see, know, love, hear, and respond to a person. More remaining, more abiding means more of God in your life, more of Him in your activities, your thoughts, and your desires. And every area of our lives... David got this in Psalm 42, verse 1. David got a hold of this, and he says, As the deer pants for the water brooks, so pants my soul for you, O God. Nothing will satisfy but you. David, the great king, he said, I get this. I know that I can't do anything outside of God. I have to have more of God and less of me. And so he practiced it. Dr. Wilkinson continues in that same page. He says, in our Western-style rush to do and perform for God, we often falter at the task of simply remaining, abiding, as we enjoy God's company. Yes, we were created to be dissatisfied and incomplete with less, as we just read in Psalm 42.1. Created to be dissatisfied. Could you imagine? Why? Because God wants this relationship with us. He wants this relationship with all people. 
God desires to abide us, with us and, and, and abide in Him. John 15, 9 in the Amplified says, I have loved you just as the Father has loved me. Same word, abide. Meno. Abide in my love. Continue in His love. Continue with me. This ongoing, radical relationship that we have with Him. So abiding really is about love. The Father's love abiding in us and our love for Him, with Him, and then overflowing to others. It's amazing. It's about that desire to remain in Him and to go after Him. And then I had to ask myself, well, how, how do we remain close to Him? How do we stay in that place? Because um, of all the years I was doing horticulture, we used to do different kinds of graphs. And when you take a, a, a stock that you want to use and you want to put something different on it, you have to prepare both ends of the, of, of the plant to do the graph. This, this stock that could be uh, a different kind of stock, could be, I use, we used ash in those days, and then we'd take a lilac and we would graft them in. And there was different Y graphs, different kinds of graphs we'd use. The mistake, when I was teaching students, the mistake they would make were two major mistakes why it wouldn't work. The one is they made this graph too, this hole too big. And there's too much for the plant to heal, so it was too large. And the second thing is that they wouldn't make the graft identical. So and if the graft looked like this and they cut it like that, and you do this, it doesn't work. It has to have the same shape. And then you would use grafting material, and then you would wrap this thing tight and make sure it was well taken care of so that the graft would take. Now, that's what Jesus has done for us. He has taken us the branches, and he has grafted us into him properly. So every single believer is grafted in properly into him. The problem is we are not reproducing what we're supposed to produce when we're grafted with Him. And so there's a couple of principles to help us embrace what we do. The first principle, there's two here, the first principle is to break through to abiding. We must deepen. Say deepen. Yeah, deepen the quality of our devoted time with God. Pastor, this is old news. Yes, it is. But we still don't have it. I still wrestle with this. What do I mean by this? Well, how do we have this relationship to be more devoted? It's the basics. It's the ancient pathways of our faith. It really is. It's those solid foundations that have never, ever changed for every believer worldwide. If they're brand new or if you've walked with the Lord most of your life, they're screaming at us today, those pathways, and telling us to move beyond devotional times. Now, there's nothing wrong with devotional times. I'm sure quite a few of you have devotional times where you have a book or books or some format that you use to do devotions. Awesome. Not enough. What? That's not fair. I'm being a good Christian. I'm doing my devotions. Well, I think these days if I'm going to produce fruit that remains, I've got to go deeper. I've got to go beyond devotions. And I'll explain this to you in a moment. Because I've had to wrestle this through. And I want to break through in abiding because I want to abide in Him. And, 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 I, and here we go, folks. You know how you do it? <laughs> you set apart more time <laughs> to build a relationship. You go, what? More time? How do I do that? How do I set up? Now, how many of you here are early risers? Let me ask you. I don't mean when the alarm goes. So I wake up, if I set the alarm for 6 a.m., I wake up before it goes off. Anybody else like that? What? You know, I don't know how they keep alarms in business because we wake up before they... So, and how many of you smash the alarm when it goes off? Yeah. We, we actually bought one for our son, Nathan, because he would never wake up. Alarm go off, you know, when he's a teenager. We finally bought one that you could throw. <laughs> you could actually physically throw the alarm clock. It wouldn't break it. It'd bounce off the wall and stuff. But there's something about rising early and spending time with God. Not all of us can do it. I get that. But I want to tell you, when I read through Scripture and I read through some of the, the biographies of some of the great leaders in the Christian faith, every single one of them found a way to rise early and abide longer. Every one of them. I remember when we were doing Hunter Huntley Street back in the day, and it was right downtown in those days, the old building. And I was doing nightlight, and I would go there, as I've told you before, I'd go there for the show from 3 to 5 a.m. So it was a live show for two hours. I had to be there at 1 a.m., and I'm totally not a night person. Just ask April. 
Like, totally not a night person. So when they asked me to do this, I said, are you kidding me? There's people awake from 3 to 5 in the morning. David Maine said there's two cities. There's the daytime city and the nighttime city. There's two groups of people. And we got to minister to the night people. And so I was doing this. And I remember at 5 a.m. when we'd finished and we were taking the bit of makeup off and talking about the show and wrapping up and so on, David Maines would come in, 5.30 in the morning. And uh, he would put in newspapers in those days on the, on the tables in the little coffee room they had there. And I asked him, I said, David, why do you do that? He said, because all the staff have to be here at 6 a.m. and we pray through what's happening in the news. What's happening locally, what's happening nationally, what's happening globally. And it's all right here in the paper. <laughs> and I listen to this and I read it and we pray. And, and many times he'd come in at 5 a.m. He'd ask us how the show went how we were doing, and then he'd pray for us. And, and he did this regularly, and, and I was amazed at this guy. I was amazed. Even Wilkinson, when you read through his life, Dr. Wilkinson, he said there was a time where God said to him, you're not abiding, you're doing your devotions, but you're not abiding. And he sort of argued with God, and he finally said, what do I need to do? And the Holy Spirit said, you need to get up at 5 a.m. He goes, 5 a.m., I'm not getting up at 5 a.m. Don't you know what kind of day I put in? I work all day, I do meetings at night, I'm not getting up at 5 a.m. So he argued with God for a while, and then he finally gave up arguing, and he obeyed. And he said the very first time he did, he said he put his paper there and his pen and his Bible, and he went, okay, Lord, I'm here, speak. He said he couldn't wake up. I mean, he said he went through several, several weeks of this kind of process, and then he said one day, the Lord just spoke to him and downloaded a bunch of stuff, and he said from that day on, I looked forward to that moment. He said, it was the greatest moment of every day. Does that take work? Does that take discipline? Yes. If we're going to remain and abide, we need to be disciplined in our disciplines. We need to be disciplined in our disciplines. I'm preaching to the choir here, guys, right here. And the Lord speaks to me about this stuff too, believe me. I'm not standing up here saying I got it all together, but God's working on me the same way. Uh, the second thing is save, savor God's word. I mean, eat his word, eat his word, memorize it, yes, but live it. That's the fruit. It's when you start living the word. You start living out what the word says. That's when things happen. Just memorizing it doesn't do a whole lot for us unless we live what it says. It says here in Colossians 3, 6, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Deeply, wonderfully. Another thing is need to, to talk. Listen, we're, we offer, again, right now we're offering it, the Hearing God seminar that any of you can come and take. If you're struggling to hear God or you just want to be renewed in this or be challenged again, come and take it. And we will constantly offer this because this body needs to be a body that hears God. Every single one of us. All the time. Because He speaks to us all the time as I abide in Him, as I remain in Him. But if I'm not doing that, I'm not going to hear Him. And, and another thing we can do is pick up one of these things for, what, buck ninety-nine or whatever they are, Canadian, $17 US, but, you know, whatever. And you pick one of these things up, and I have quite a few of these, and you start journaling. What do I mean? Well, you set it here, have your coffee if that's what you need, open your Bible, whatever way you're using a devotional, and say, Lord, speak to me beyond the devotional. Speak to me beyond what, what somebody has written. Speak to me what you want to say to me, and then you write it down. You write it down. I go back and look at some of these from years ago. Years ago. Some of them that I have kicking around. And I start reading through some of them, what the Lord spoke to me. I go, whoa, Lord, I forgot you said that. I forgot you did that. That's why the scripture says, remind the generations of our Lord. These things are here to remind us. These pillars are here. These rocks are here. to remind. When you're walking along the highway, when you're sitting with them, remind them of the things the Lord has done and what he is about to do. And so when I go back through these, these journal books and I start reading and I just think, Lord, you spoke to me about this. You spoke to me about that. You showed me what to do here. You told me what to do here. You showed me from Elijah. You showed me from Joshua. You showed me. You showed me. Lord, now I have to abide in those things and grow in them. 
We should all be doing that. That's called journaling. And I encourage you to do it. I encourage you to do it. If you're not already doing it, you'll be blessed when you do. Does God give me profound things every time? No. No, he doesn't. But when he does, I'm glad I'm there and I'm ready. And I need to operate in that. Our new president of the EMCC, that's why April and I were out west. We didn't just go out there to sit on an airplane and abide our time uh, and drive up to Banff and do all that stuff, which was wonderful. Hey, we had a Jeep, by the way, Jody. It was awesome. Uh, they upgraded us to a, um, a Cherokee G chief, Grand Cherokee. Is that what it's called? Oh, that baby's loaded. That was a nice machine. It was really good on gas, too. I was, I was shocked. It was a Chrysler, and it was really nice. Ha! <laughs> ha! I'm not going to repeat that. But see Jody after if you want to talk about Jeeps. But our new president is spirit-filled. He's a spirit-filled guy. Now, I want to tell you, I've been in the denomination since 91. We've had good leaders as presidents and so on. But this is the first one I've seen that is actively open to the things of the spirit. Yes! We need that, folks. We need that. And he had a time at the end where he had the different people all lined up, pastors and stuff, and, and then he had people all assigned to come around and anoint us with oil. Never seen that. That's a first. And then he said, the sides are open if you need prayer for healing. That was a first. I'm going, oh, whoa, Lord. And then having Brian Dorkson lead us in worship helped. That was totally a surprise. Wednesday morning we go in and the, the, the band that was playing where all their stuff was gone, I thought we were, you know, somebody just played guitar or keyboard, which is fine. There's Brian Dorks in his band. And they let us all that day and wow, did we have a time with the Lord. We had more of a time with the Lord than we did. We did more business with God than we did business, business. It was amazing. So it was an honor and a privilege. Thank you for praying for us. So, so we were abiding in the presence of the Holy Spirit. So, folks, that's what God calls us to do. But if I'm not doing these personal things of remaining, then I can miss what he wants to do when we're together. Are you hearing me? Because I'm prepared. I'm prepared in my spirit. I'm drinking the waters. So the second principle to break through to abiding, we must broaden our devoted time. Taking it from those morning devotions that appointed to all to all day attentiveness to his voice, all day long, all day long. So this afternoon, I don't know what you've got planned, but there may be an opportunity for you to pray for somebody. There may be an opportunity for you to help somebody. There may be an opportunity for you to witness and tell them about Jesus and lead them to the Lord. Why? Because your radar's up. Beep, 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 beep. Ten of ten of ten of boop, 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 boop. Lord, how do you want to use me? Boop, 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 boop. You're watching. You're listening. For those who have eyes to see and ears to hear, Jesus said. See what the Spirit is doing. See what the Lord is saying to the church in the Revelation. And that's what he's talking about here. And God invites us into this place as the bride to tap into his presence. Brother Lawrence, in the 17th century, if you can imagine, he was a lay Christian. You know what he did? He worked in the kitchen of a monastery. He did dishes. He was a dishwasher all day long. Talk about pruned hands. You know, no joy for dishes or whatever they use. Palm olive. You know, like he didn't, have, he's just doing the dishes all day long. But listen what this guy wrote. He says, I do nothing else but abide in his holy presence. <laughs> doing dishes? And I do this by simple attentiveness and a habitual loving turning of my eyes on him. This I call a wordless, secret conversation between the soul and God, which no longer ends. He's saying, all the time, I'm being used by the Lord. I do all things unto the Lord, and I watch. Now, we're not always going to get it right. I'm a living example of that, that's for sure. Because uh, when you go to Walmart, and you sit there with a cart by the front door and you watch the, the person who's on security like I was the one day and, and she came over and stood by me and, and she said, oh, I, all day long I hear bells. I hear them in the night. I hear them during the day. I said, really? I said, have you had prayer for that? And she said, what? I said, have you had prayer for that? I said, God can heal you of that. And she said, hold on. 
So she walked over to the entrance where everybody comes in. She turned around, grabbed a pair of sunglasses off the rack, and she held them in the thing. It went, ding, 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 ding. She said, that's what I hear all day and all night long. I said, I can't help you, sorry. <laughs> and we both smiled. You never know, right? Well, I thought she was talking about something else. She was telling me about people stealing. But the point is, when you're abiding with him, you never know. Selling vehicles, Jody, is not about selling vehicles. It's about meeting people who need Jesus. It's about working with people who need the Lord. And that's true for all of us. Dave, in your business, are you landscaping still? You going around seeing different customers, talking to them? And I know you're a great witness for the Lord. I know that. All I'm saying is, folks, in your business, you have people coming in all the time. God does this. He brings broken people across our paths. If we're abiding in Him, remaining in Him, our attentiveness is there. We respond. Otherwise, we're just doing the sweet by and by. We're not preparing ourselves every day for what He has for us. So, what do we do? Well, we make ourselves available. That's what we do. We just say, here, here my Lord, help me abide. Let's pray. Stand with me, please, as the worship team comes. There's two things for our altar time. The first one, do I want to go deeper in my abiding? I want to move beyond devotionals. If that's in your heart, then, then let's pray. Let's, let's mark it on the, on the sand this morning at the altar. Let's mark it down. Say, okay, today we're journaling this. Today's the day. Then you go home and you write it down and you start. Second thing, the altar is open for any prayer need today. Some of you need prayer for healing. Some of you need prayer for restoration. Some of you need prayer for your marriages. Some of you need prayer for direction. There's all kinds of needs here that I sense the Lord saying that we need to pray for today. The first one is the, the I want to go deeper and to abide. That's the first one. The second one is other areas that are of need. Father God, I want to thank you that we have the opportunity now to, to abide, <laughs> to rest in your presence. Hmm. Hmm. Lord, just let us rest. These altars are open. The Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now and saying, I want you to abide more with me. And you know God's speaking to you about that. I'm already up here because he's been telling me the same thing. And I don't always do it. And I've repented. But he's teaching me to abide. And to be attentive. To remain in him. To stay close to the master. Is the Spirit speaking to you right now? If he is, come. Don't wait, just come. If you have another need, come. Mark's going to play, the worship team's going to sing a little bit. And as they do, come. And then after that, I'll ask the people to pray with you to come to pray. So if it's you, come right now.